Margaret Fuller was born in 1810 into a generation that was just after the revolutionary generation and she was part of a group of people that felt there should be a second American Revolution, an intellectual one, in which the very underpinnings of American life would be examined and in a way rewritten. A powerful thinker, a powerful writer, somebody with great political urgency, um, a sense of engagement with the world, engagement with what the United States could be, a sense of honesty about its shortcomings and also its potential. Here's a woman uh, who, in a sense, lived with this tension between culture and politics, and also a woman whose identity was so much bound up with her as an intellectual, as a thinker. That's what distinguished her. That's why she wasn't like other women and other men. When people, you know, view Margaret Fuller, um, as we've sort of come to, to think of her in the 20th century as this lone female genius, the, the solitary woman who was a part of the transcendentalist group. They really miss out on the fact that she was so interested in social engagement. She was not solitary. That led her to really radical positions in some ways, especially when it came to the topic of women, their role in society, their position vis-a-vis -vis men. When she got to Rome, she just loved it. She loved the atmosphere. She loved the dancing, the saltarello. She loved the art. Started to, to feel the, the stirrings of the the Roman Revolution. This is where she really went from being a tourist to being a resident, a sojourner, if you will. She's also well connected with the Italian revolutionaries and her column in the Tribune goes from being this travel account to being more of a political sort of column where she's publishing translations of sort of decrees that the revolutionaries were posting for the public and so forth and she's describing the scene and especially when actual hostilities break out. She's there as a war correspondent describing um, what's happening. The publication of the memoirs of Margaret Fuller Asoli, as they were called, actually rocketed her into a kind of fame uh, soon after her death. I would say that more than anything else, they contributed to her reputation lasting, even though she was no longer there to attend these suffrage conventions, the women's rights conventions. She couldn't see that her legacy was kept alive. So Fuller was trying to set a national agenda and trying to inspire people. Advocating for women's right to a vocation, right to an education, interested in trying to get women to work cooperatively to help one another. Giving people something to hope for, encouraging them to feel as though they were connected to the rest of the world, encouraging them to be revolutionary in their thinking, their actions, to work for, for justice, uh, for brotherhood. Uh, for hope and freedom around the world.